We're delighted to have everybody with us today. April 2012, 11 women, mostly strangers to mm -hmm. one another, sat down to dinner at the invitation of Barbara Schlachter. This is Barbara right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she died in 2016. But by the end of this, this evening in 2012, this group rose up as a foundation for 100 grannies. In many ways, we are continuing her efforts to fulfill her legacy. We have a film series in October and this wonderful lecture series in March. Jerry's frequented our lecture series in person and on Zoom. Since uh, we had COVID, we've been doing this on Zoom. Uh, but before that, we showed the books that we give to the schools. And Deb is going to speak briefly about a couple of the books we give the schools to the elementary and high schools and junior highs on the environment. OK, yeah, thanks, Joan. So again, this was Barbara's idea. We should be giving some of these some good books to the elementary schools. So we started this in 2015. And since that used to be just elementary as well, now it's junior her junior highs heard about it than the high schools. So now we give books to all three levels. So I'll just mention a couple of the books. And then um, so we do a little fundraising to help offset the cost of these books because there's 20 to one elementary schools three junior highs and four high schools. So one of the books for the upper upper elementary this year, so the teacher librarians choose these books because they know these books have been vetted, they know the good books. And this one is called Rebel Girls and it's 25 short biographies of girls and women who have worked to fight climate change and support sustainability efforts. So this, is, this has got some really good stories of lots of, of good work that's being done. Um, the uh, another one for the element lower elementaries is called ice and it's a it's a I was reading this last night I had to read some of them out loud to my husband because they're so fun and cute uh, it's about all the animals in the arctic and antarctic and so I was reading about the emperor penguin last night so the, the illustrations are really cute and then there's a sing song kind of sing song poem that the um, Douglas Florian has written and then at the bottom there's more information about the, the particular animals that live in the Arctic. And he calls it the refrigerator part of the earth. Um, the book I don't have to show, but I'm excited about that the high school teachers shows have chosen is called Science and the Skeptic, Discerning Fact from Fiction by Mark Zimmer. So this will be a good, um, it helps students um, understand fake news, pseudoscience and quackery, how um, that becomes Scrooge's um, spreading through society from social media all the way to Congress. So he talks about the line between entertainment and reality between fact and fiction. So I think this would be a good book for the high school students to have um, available to them. So again, we, in we invite anybody who'd like to help us support this effort for the adding these books to our school libraries. Um, you can either write a check and send it to the grannies post office box, I'll put that in the chat, or we now have a donation button on our granny webpage, and I'll put the granny webpage in the chat as well. So thanks, everybody, for coming and for supporting. Well, thanks to Joan and Deb and all that the grannies do. I'm a big fan of the grannies for a long time, since 2012, I guess, really, when uh, it began. I admire uh, what you have done. I admire, yeah, that you've even got arrested, some of you, and, and uh, the advocacy and, uh, and uh, the environmentalism activism, which you've shown is an inspiration to, to many of us. And I also am a fan, a, a, a big uh, a fan of Barbara Schlechter, and I had the good fortune to work with her on different radio shows and television and even television and uh, 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 I miss her. So thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I think uh, really highly of, of you guys. We're going to talk about climate change and uh, our future, hopefully in, in keeping with grannies for a livable future today. And uh, there's I plan to save plenty of time for questions. And I do have a class after this, so 
I we can't go over. <laughs> this is the planet that we're talking about today, and and many of you know that I usually start with this this shot from uh, space of planet Earth, the big blue marble, and uh, for the purpose of the atmosphere is on here, but you can't even hardly see it. Such a thin, uh, it's 50 miles thick about being held by gravity onto the skin of the earth. And it's a relatively small compartment in terms of its mass. And so it's easy when you have, gosh, 8 billion people now, that's what we're up to. And our gross world product is something like $94 trillion. When you have that much activity on planet earth and that many people, gosh, it's easy to affect the atmosphere. It's so small. And we did that and we're, we're doing that. And it's sort of a, in terms of climate change, it's sort of a top down warming. It's like wrapping a blanket around the earth, keeping the heat in from greenhouse gases that have been emitted. And it starts in the atmosphere, but gosh, now we're, we're here today to talk about, of course, it's warmed uh, the land and changed many things on the land shown here. And even the oceans. I would have never imagined that we could change in one person's lifetime the oceans so much as we have. Last year, uh, you may remember that we had a, a new report come out of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's called AR6 because it's the sixth report in a series beginning in 1990. And uh, each of those reports became more and more stern and more and more uh, concerning in terms of its language. And in fact, now the language reads something like here in the first uh, bullet, it's unequivocal that human influence is warm. There, there's no debate. We've warmed the atmosphere, the ocean and the land, the cryosphere, the, that's our ice and the biosphere all all of that has occurred. There's no debate, it's unequivocal. And uh, we, in order to reverse this or at least slow it, we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. That's that blanket that is covering the atmosphere by 45% by 2030. Gosh, that's only eight years now. And, uh, and take it to net zero. We gotta get out of the fossil fuel age. We have to do it by approximately 20, 50. That's not to say we won't burn some fossil fuels in, in 2050. We likely will, but we also have, have to have programs to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at the same time to make it net zero by 2050. It's not much time. Kind of surprising from a geologic standpoint, the carbon dioxide, which is the most important of the greenhouse gases, but there are many different greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide has never been higher in the atmosphere in 2 million years, 2 million years. We are doing an experiment that is just unprecedented in, uh, in just a couple hundred years, and even the warming shorter than that. The other greenhouse gases, some important ones like methane and nitrous oxide have never been this high in 800,000 years. So, the evidence of these changes and changes in extremes, heat waves, heavy precipitation, droughts, tropical cyclones, has gotten stronger and stronger with each report since 1990. And this one is, gosh, even more certain, very clear, even since the last report in 2013. The greenhouse gases uh, from fossil fuels, from the burning of fossil fuels, uh, uh, is this big red arrow right here going into the atmosphere from burning coal, oil, and natural gas. And the, in the case of coal, it's been around for about 340 million years. It took 340 million years for that coal to form in the Earth's crust. And once again, we're trying to burn it up in just a couple hundred years, quote, the fossil fuel age. And of course, you're going to change that, that thin veneer, that atmosphere that we talked about. Because this red arrow going up, putting carbon dioxide, our exhaust, into the atmosphere, 
and this one from land clearing. It's smaller, but also important. They supersede, they uh, are much greater than the black arrows going down, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into woody biomass, into trees and forests, and into the, the roots of those, and coming down into the ocean. Carbon dioxide is a weak acid. It's you know the stuff that we have in our in our Coca Cola uh, to make it fizzy, and it is acidic, and it's acidifying the oceans as well as uh, absorbing some of the CO two out of the atmosphere. Because the red arrows are bigger than the black arrows, we have an accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it lasts a long time, more than 100 years. So uh, we have about 16 billion metric tons per year accumulating in the atmosphere. Roughly, uh, it increases our concentration in the atmosphere about 2.4 part per million each and every year. When that happens, you can imagine that the carbon dioxide concentration is going up, up, up ever since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the, when we invented the steam in, engine uh, and we began to burn large quantities of coal, uh, the CO2 has gone up, up, up. And it, the red arrows indicate the annual variability, which is due to the seasons. Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii is in the Northern Hemisphere. Most of the land is in the Northern Hemisphere. So we're looking at the signal, which is a little bit different than the signal in the Southern Hemisphere, offset by roughly six months. And you can see that in the springtime, the carbon dioxide concentration goes down each year as uh, leaves come out and pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And then in the fall, when uh, everything goes dormant, the leaves fall off and the CO2 concentration goes back up. But the overriding concern is the, uh, is the black line, the steady increase ever since the Industrial Revolution of uh, increasing CO2. We started at about 280 parts per million over here on the y-axis, and now we're around 420. Uh, parts per million. When you put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, you can expect to eventually uh, have an increase in temperature. And, and it, sort, it looks like the signal, this is the so-called temperature anomaly on the y-axis. That just means the difference from times of the uh, Industrial Revolution. And uh, you can see it, it kind of the, sig the annual variability is shown in blue and the running average is shown in red. And you can see that the signal kind of emerged from the noise, if you will, this interannual noise as we call it, in about the 70s or 80s. The 80s were warmer than any decade before in the instrumental record. The 90s were warmer than that, the 2000s, and so on, and so on. So that now we're about 1.16 degrees Celsius. That's about 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit warmer uh, than in those pre-industrial times. And uh, that may not sound like very much, two degrees warmer, but it, it's enough to really change things. Uh, we're not just breaking temperature records now, we're shattering them. And uh, for example, last year, both the Arctic and the Antarctic at the same time were 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal at the same time. Unbelievable. Uh, so we, we, if someone asks you what accounts for the cold we had right before Christmas, for example, we're still going to have some cold days, but the warm days, when we set a temperature record, those are occurring, it, it, it varies year to year a little bit, but those are occurring about three or four times more frequently than the cold records. If we keep this up, if we don't uh, decrease our emissions, eventually we will get to the point where we never have a cold 
temperature record. But right now, we're setting warm temperature records about three or four times more frequently than cold temperature records. We'll still have cold temperatures, but not very frequently. In order for the temperature to go up like that, that means that emissions had to have gone up. And indeed, they've gone steadily up, just like carbon dioxide concentration has. This graph goes from 1990 till almost present day. And uh, the y-axis here is the billions of metric tons. We call that gigatons. Billions of metric tons of carbon dioxide. Just imagine with 8 billion people, each and every one of us, if you put 10 gallons of gas into your car and you run it around, burn that up, that's about 200 pounds of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. For each and every one of us, we're talking in Iowa on average, roughly 30 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from each and every person, man, woman, and child. Uh, in Iowa. So it's accumulating fast. In fact, yeah, like uh, the emissions on the order of 38 billion metric tons uh, each and every year. And it's gone steadily up. You can see some, uh, some kind of blips. Uh, this one is from the Great Recession in 2007, 2008. You probably remember that, the uh, how the uh, uh, property crisis and, and building crisis. Uh, and then more recently, the beginning of the pandemic in 2020-21, uh, we decreased our emissions of 6 or 7%. But the next year, it popped right back up. And now we're actually this year again at a record high level and haven't uh, leveled it off. If we want to stabilize the atmosphere, and start to just begin to get a handle on the problem, we need it to come down like the United Nations report says, AR6, it's got to come down something like this blue line here in just the next eight years. And it's got to go down about half of that 38 down to about 18 or 19 in just eight years to stabilize the atmosphere. There'll still be warming. We've already set things up for more uh, warming, but that'll begin to stabilize it if we can if we can do that. I mentioned uh, uh, to Joan Cook uh, before we started that we're going to see my son and who lives in the hills behind Monterey um, over spring break. And this is the Pacific Coast Highway. Some of you may have traveled that at some point near uh, Big Sur last year. And you can see, of course, the wildfires, the extreme events that have also gone up as a result of uh, uh, this warming and, uh, and the greenhouse gases. And as you also know, this story was followed by uh, intense rainfall uh, in recent months uh, and the so-called um, Pineapple Express and, and atmospheric rivers, and such that now there's been all kinds of landslides as well as uh, mudslides once the earth, once the trees are gone and nothing is there to hold the land back. Both are events uh, associated with uh, climate change. And here, well, here's the atmospheric rivers. That's not the exact same spot, but it's nearby. Uh, the loss of Pacific Coast Highway number one um, uh, and the atmospheric rivers that are coming from the area of Hawaii, extreme moisture in the air, traveling through the atmosphere and, and then hitting uh, land mass and condensing and causing extreme rain, like is shown here on the left. I also wanted to mention Hurricane Ian last year as an example of an extreme event. I think in terms of damages, it was the biggest uh, hurricane ever uh, last year. And if you recall, it hit two or three different times uh, in Florida. And uh, they're still in Sanibel. Some of you may have been there. They're still digging out in Sanibel and Ding Darling Preserve 
as a result of Hurricane uh, Ian last year. Ice melt, uh, you remember the AR6 report talked about cryogenics and that's the ice on earth. We're, we're losing the ice on earth. And um, one of the places we're losing it is in Greenland, uh, shown here. Um, the, uh, one of my colleagues and friends, Connie Steffen, uh, at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, where I had an appointment also, um, lost his life trying to, over the last uh, 15 years, trying to measure how much ice is melting here in uh, Greenland. And this is a typical ice melt in summertime. It falls down, they call it a moulin, a, sha a shaft, down to the uh, land ice interface. We worry about that because we worry about the uh, lubrication of that ice land interface because these glaciers, as you know, are moving. Okay, they're moving at glacial speeds, uh, like we joke about. My wife says that's me sometimes. Uh, they're moving at glacial speeds, but if it speeds up, uh, then the ice could crash off much, much faster and raise uh, sea level. How much is this that Connie measured? It's about half of Lake Erie each year is running off of Greenland. Half the volume of Lake Erie is running off Greenland each and every year. And it's adding to the uh, sea level rise that we're experiencing in the ocean. About half of that sea level rise is due to melting ice all over uh, Earth. And about half of it is due to the thermal expansion of oceans because the oceans are getting warmer also and water expands when it gets warmer. So those are the two main reasons why we're seeing increasing, uh, accelerating uh, sea level rise. By the way, Connie, it was a cloudy day and he left uh, Swiss camp, which is just a bunch of tents. He asked me to go there with him in 2016. And I told him, Connie, I think I'm too old for this. And my wife says it's one of the few really smart things I ever did because Connie uh, in 2020 fell down one of these shafts and uh, body was never recovered in the, in the fog. The ice shelves are melting in Antarctica. Um, that's the other place where we have a lot of ice, Greenland and Antarctica, uh, not to mention the continental glaciers, they're melting also. But uh, this one, you may have heard of it, the Thwaites in West Antarctica. We've been watching this for a long time now, more than 20 years that I've been uh, uh, lecturing about it. It's often called the Doomsday Glacier. I don't call it that because that's not very scientific, but it's called the Doomsday Glacier because uh, it's bigger than Rhode Island. And if it falls into the sea, that again, uh, th that ice is holding back other ice. And once again, the glacial speed of glaciers calving and, for, and going into the ocean would be much, much greater. And the entire West Antarctic uh, area is really quite unstable. If, the, if Thwaites, this is Thwaites right here, if it goes into the ocean, we're talking about over a relatively short period of time, maybe a couple decades, we're talking about a 3.3 meter rise in sea level, 10 foot rise in sea level from one glacier. That's how much ice is there. And we've known that one is unstable for a really long time. It looks like the warm uh, water from the ocean because the oceans are warming is undercutting it. It rests partly up on land and partly it's floating the tip at sea. And the, and the warm water is coming underneath it and cutting it free, uh, uh, and that's the problem. We never thought East Antarctica was unstable, but this past year also, bad news, uh, Denman, the Denman um, Glacier in East Antarctica also seems to be in danger of falling into the sea. And uh, it would cause itself a one and a half meter rise, about four or five feet 
rise in sea level over a relatively short period of time. Now, you, you might find it surprising that AR6 doesn't even talk about this very much because the probability is still small, I should tell you, but the consequences are humongous. We're talking about hundreds of millions of environmental refugees in a very, very short time. And, you know, humans, we, we don't do very good when you have almost uh, zero probability and infinite risk. When you multiply, I remember from, uh, from school back in Davenport, when you multiply zero times infinity, what do you get? Mathematician says zero times infinity is undefined. And that's one reason we don't talk about it. We, as humans, our brains, we, we don't really know how to deal with these situations where you have very low probability, but very, very high consequences as a result. And that's sort of the, uh, we call it abrupt climate change. And it is discussed more in this last report, AR6, than at any uh, previous time. And it is, it is very troubling. For years, we launched satellites, a series of satellites called Ceres, uh, C-E-R-E-S, to try to figure out how the energy budget of Earth is changing, if it is changing. We haven't had much luck with that program because the uh, amount of uh, energy that the Earth receives is so variable due to cloud cover, so variable in time, and so variable spatially that it's really hard to integrate that and figure out how, how much the energy balance is changing. Uh, in math, we call it an ill-conditioned problem because we're looking for a small difference in power in watts per square meter, a small difference in sun's energy reaching the earth uh, between two large numbers. And that's very difficult to uh, ascertain. However, finally, uh, some smart people got the idea, if you want to know, uh, if you want the smoking gun, if you really want to prove how much uh, heat the Earth is receiving and how much it's changed, uh, you've got to go to the ocean where the heat capacity is so great. The thermal mass is tremendous. And it's only been since 2005 that we went to the oceans and tried to measure with great accuracy uh, how much energy the Earth is, is receiving, how much has, it has changed the energy budget as a result of the greenhouse gases. So uh, you can go online if you'd like after our talk and you can actually see where the, these floats are floating uh, in this bottom graph or bo bottom pick picture here, there's about 4,000 of them out now floating freely in the sea. They come up for, uh, to recharge their batteries with sunlight and relay their messages to a satellite, all the data. And then they go down through a programmed dive. And they measure very, very accurately the temperature, the pressure, the salinity, uh, down to 2,000 feet. And actually, now we have some that are going down to 6,000 meters. Uh, and then they come back up after seven or 10 days and uh, uh, use the sun to recharge their batteries again. It's only since this, this is an internet, big international program. U.S. is a part of it. Uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And uh, because of this program now, we have the smoking gun. We know that the earth is out of balance in terms of the energy that it's receiving. And it's about, actually now it's about, when I wrote this, it was 0 0.77. Now it's about one watt per square meter. One of the tiny little uh, uh, Christmas tree bulbs, uh, twinkle lights, is roughly one watt. So it'd be about like a, one of those Christmas tree lights on every 10 square feet, every meter square of uh, 
surface of the earth on all the time, 24-7, 365 days a year. That's how much warming. Well, that doesn't mean too much to people. So I had my students work it out. And, and this is really grim uh, statistic, but it's true. Uh, I had them work it out in terms of the heat from an Hiroshima bomb. So what if we were igniting Hiroshima bombs in the ocean? It would take seven Hiroshima nuclear bombs going off every single second, every second of the day, 365 days a year continuously to add this much heat to the ocean. It's an immense, it's an immense amount of heat that we're adding. I had my students calculate too, well, how much heat do we make just by burning all those fossil fuels? And the answer is th this amount of heat that we're measuring in the ocean now is about 20 times greater than the heat that we get from burning all the fossil fuels. So this is a very potent uh, effect that these greenhouse gases are having in the atmosphere trapping back radiation off of the earth and uh, adding it top down, first to the atmosphere and then to the land and to the oceans. I kind of like this diagram because of uh, the, the colors, but it also shows that there's hope. Uh, this is the emissions from fossil fuels uh, each year in billions of metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. These are the historical emissions since 1980. And here we are right now in, 19, in 2023. And if I had to say, I would say we're following, these are the model simulations from, we're, we're tracking 20, 39 different models the United Nations from all over the world and uh, looking at how they agree and disagree. And these are different scenarios of how people are gonna respond, how countries are gonna respond. This is business as usual, the red ones, if we do nothing. We're actually kind of following, uh, I can make a pretty strong case, this uh, orange or yellow line here, where we are leveling off and going down. But unfortunately, we're not going down fast enough to really stabilize the atmosphere and our, and our climate. The hope is if we could follow these simulations, the blue ones, such that we're at zero around 2050 or 2060 in terms of fossil fuels, we're out of the fossil fuel age about that time, that would allow us to stabilize at a much, much lower temperature, it would even allow us maybe, maybe, maybe to reach the United Nations goal up here in the first bullet, which is we're at 1.1 degrees Celsius now or two degrees Fahrenheit. The United Nations goal is 1.5 or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. A little bit warmer, about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than what we have experienced so far. That we've already loaded in, and only if we can follow these blue lines here, which we are not following right now. If we continue the way that we're going, and if I'm right, that we're kind of following these orange lines here, then we're gonna uh, have a warming more than twice of what we've had so far, with much more uh, events, wildfires, melt, sea level rise, hurricanes, and so on. We would have a temperature addition of about not two degrees Fahrenheit, but 4.8 degrees Fahrenheit in our kids and our kids' kids' lifetime. So we got we to gotta get together. We got to do it this decade, start to try to achieve this blue, these blue lines here. And even then it's gonna take some time to stabilize the atmosphere, at least 50 years or something like that. And to begin to eventually, the good news is it's, re it's reversible. Most of what I've told you about is reversible, uh, but it takes time because the gases stay in the atmosphere 
for so long. So what can we do? Well, one good thing we're doing is the United Nations is meeting. They just had another meeting in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt last November. It was, I would say, mixed success meeting. They sought to remove solidarity between all the countries who signed on to the Paris Agreement. That was 100, I was there. My wife too, Jana was with me. I was a delegate, uh, 197, it, it was, a tremendous feeling when 197 countries agreed that this is a serious problem and we've got to do something about it. Everybody agreed, that's everybody. And uh, these are the goals, we've already talked about that. And uh, the problem is that we're falling short of these goals. And what can we do? Well, it's ever more clear to me anyhow, that we've got to care for and help each other with this problem, very serious global problem. And we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions together. We still haven't reduced them. We're barely, it looks like maybe beginning to level it off. One good news thing is the Global Methane Hub. Uh, one of our students from University of Iowa, Greg Carmichael and I, uh, shared uh, um, Marcelo Mena, some of you may have met him. He's the CEO of the Global Methane Hub. We view that as good news, that's low hanging fruit because methane is a potent greenhouse gas and it's, it, we think it's mostly coming from leaks in our natural gas system from fracking and exploration and gas distribution systems. And that's rather easy in the big scheme of things to fix that. And that would give us a big uh, improvement in warming potential uh, from the global method. And yeah, a University of Iowa graduate, Marcelo Mena is heading that up. Um, and that came out of the uh, Biden administration um, at the, uh, in recent United Nations meeting, the one, the one in Scotland. Uh, green, uh, green Climate Fund for Vulnerable Countries. Back in the day, Hillary Clinton was the first to propose $100 billion per year for the vulnerable countries, the island countries who are going underwater, having to actually vacate people from islands right now. The Sub-Saharan African countries, which are in severe drought and, and uh, hunger right now, Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, and even Congo, Kenya, uh, the Green Climate Fund, we're almost there at $100 billion uh, per year, what was pledged back in Paris. And those countries and those people have done the least to cause climate change. They've emitted almost nothing. And they are being affected the most. And they deserve our respect and our help. Uh, to work together on this global problem. I have to tell you that Egypt, I said it was mixed success because the, the big uh, emphasis out of the Egypt meeting was to establish a loss and damage facility. That's sort of like FEMA on a global scale. You know about FEMA uh, in the United States when we have a big hurricane like Ian. Until 3.30, but I can call you after that. When FEMA comes, they help people. And that's the idea of this loss and damage facility for vulnerable people and vulnerable countries, but there's no money in it. It's kind of like a bank without any deposits yet. So hopefully there'll be progress on that later. In Egypt, there was a lot of talk that every single financial decision should have sort of like an environmental impact statement a financial, uh, a climate change evaluation of how every single loan uh, from the World uh, Bank and every single loan from the International Monetary uh, Organization should take climate change into account. Well, there's a, a we won't belabor it, but there's a, right now the vulnerable countries are at at wit's end right now. Uh, another example of an extreme last year was Egypt. 
Egypt, one at, from flooding in Egypt, extreme rainfall there, flooding at one point, one, one third of the entire country was underwater at the same time. One third of the whole country of Pakistan was underwater. And they have a payment on their debt already of about $32 billion a, a year. I, I'm sorry, they have, a, they have received loans of $32 billion a year, payment of $3 billion a year on their debt. But now the interest rates have gone up on all the vulnerable countries. We call it the debt trap. They are trapped. They've borrowed money to try to keep themselves whole, uh, to try to make uh, adaptations to climate change. And now the interest rates, and they can't even pay back the money that has been loaned to them already. Biodiversity loss, there's some good news here. Uh, last year uh, in Montreal, uh, all these countries met again. It was called COP15 because that um, the biodiversity treaty uh, has had 15 meetings. They agreed to try to protect 30% of all the marine land and marine oceans and 30% of all the land by 2030. That was just the agreement that was signed at the meeting, but it, it's not really a treaty. It's not ratified yet. We're losing about a million species a year. And it's not, I don't mean to say it's due to climate change. Climate change is one, especially for the oceans, climate change is very important to species loss because of the coral reef collapse uh, that's going on due to warmer temperatures and higher acidities due to all that carbon dioxide going into the oceans. But overall, it's only one of many causes. The biggest cause of habitat, uh, uh, biggest cause of biodiversity loss is habitat destruction. How we've taken the land, there's no place for the plants and animals to live uh, anymore. And um, so this was a very important meeting last year in Montreal, and it was signed by all countries again. And we don't even know how many species we're losing. One estimate is a, that we have about 8.7 million species, plants and animals, uh, and that uh, we're losing about 1 million of them in our kids' lifetime, in one generation, about 1 million out of 8.7 million. I mentioned earlier that most of the things we've talked about are, re are reversible. Uh, over long periods of time, some, but they are reversible. This one is not. We don't have a DNA zoo, forget Jurassic Park. We're not gonna bring these animals back. And once we lose them, they're gone forever. Today, Today, I believe, is the date on the Historic Marine Biodiversity Treaty. It has to go through our Senate. We haven't ratified it yet, but we did sign it, as I understand. It's a once in a generation opportunity that was signed on last Saturday, two days ago. It was signed. This is huge, guys. And uh, um, Nicola Clark says that once in a generation opportunity to protect the oceans, a major win for biodiversity. They've agreed that the high seas should be protected. That's all the water that's outside of the 200 mile um, uh, borderline that countries claim is their own. And the high seas amounts to about half of all the marine area. So th this is huge. If, we, if everybody ratifies this and it goes, and it just happened. So there's, there's a lot of good news here. How are we going to respond? Well, climate action, climate solutions. We're going to need, as you know, to electrify almost everything, especially our cars and our cars. The batteries in our cars are going to be a part of the grid. When we need energy uh, somewhere else, the batteries of our cars can put energy into the grid we can fill up at night when demand is very low. If we have 240 million cars in America, if every car had a storage battery, it was an electric vehicle, 
that would give us 600 gigawatts of storage. That's enough to store an awful lot of wind and solar uh, power. It, it could help us make things work. We're going to use renewable power, wind and solar. Nuclear power isn't going to help us in the, the 2030 goal. It takes too long to, to site and permit uh, nuclear power. But honestly, I can't rule it out for the long term because we have to get, we have to transition out of the fossil fuel age. We can talk about that uh, at the end. We need smart grid and pricing. I mentioned that already. Um, uh, Iowa just moved to uh, begin a, to have smart pricing with Mid-America and, and Alliant. More about that if we have time. We need to weatherize our homes. We have really old housing stock in Iowa and uh, we could save lots of energy and create really uh, just an incredible amount of jobs uh, just to adapt to climate change. It's gonna get warmer before it gets uh, better. And uh, we're, we're gonna use this to be the engine for economic opportunity. That brings me to the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Uh, Joan asked me to mention about that. When I first started lecturing about this in 1990, if you would have told me we wouldn't have an energy plan by 2023, I would have said, you're crazy. Of course, we're gonna, we're the richest country on earth. Of course, we're gonna address this. And by the way, I would have said, we're gonna have comprehensive climate change legislation also. But in fact, 33 years later, here we are, we don't have either. The closest thing we have to climate change legislation is this bipartisan bill from last year. And it's a misnomer, Inflation Reduction Act. It really is a climate bill, folks. It really is about, it's huge, 300, 750 pages long, $369 billion, for climate and environmental justice to try to uh, try to make some amends to things like Cancer Alley uh, between Baton Rouge and New Orleans where cancer rates are, are astronomical compared to the norm and people have been redlined uh, into uh, existing with so much pollution. Uh, it's unbelievable. This is the first legislation I know which is so comprehensively addressed uh, inadequate uh, servicing and, and uh, disadvantaged people. It calls, uh, right now, uh, US is on road to a 20 or 25% emission reduction uh, by 2030, with our goal being 45%. And this would take us to, uh, if, if it's, if it's, uh, Use if it's utilized, it'll take us to 40% emission reduction. Not the Paris goal, but take us much closer to the Paris goal. It calls for uh, clean energy tax credits for wind and solar for the next 10 years, $9 billion in home energy rebates and for low income people to qualify community solar power, especially for low income neighborhoods. Most of the uh, incentives for wind power are for offshore power. Uh, biodiesel and biorefineries, aviation fuels, uh, Iowa could benefit from these provisions a lot. You know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, when I was going to school uh, at Iowa State back in the day, we always talked about Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act. And these were what we call command and control legislation. Thou shalt not pollute the water. Thou shalt not <laughs> pollute the air. We can't get a law like that anymore. You cannot get that through Congress. So this first climate bill, which I'm gonna call the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, is really, it's all about incentives, carrots. We can't get command and control through Congress. So we either have to do sticks or carrots. This is a carrot act, $369 billion. If we take advantage of the carrots, we can really make a difference. 
It's the most significant climate legislation in U.S. history, bar none. And these uh, Inflation Reduction Act provisions will finance green power, tax credits, reduce our emissions, and advance environmental justice. I won't go into it. Uh, again, it's 750 pages long. There's something in here for everybody. I added up just what a single family could conceivably save if they installed heat pumps, uh, geothermal heat pumps and home energy efficiency upgrades, something like $28,000 per household um, and $1,800 per year on their energy bills. There's a lot in here for Iowa farmers. You know, we said that we're still gonna burn some fossil fuels even in 2050, but uh, we're gonna also have programs to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere Farmers in Iowa can be a big part of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. There's $20 billion in this act of incentives for farmers just to rotate their crops and put organic carbon back in the soil. Good, good Lord, we've lost half of our soil since settlement days in the 1850s here in Iowa. We've lost half of our soil. It's time to put some back put organic carbon back into the soil, take it out of the atmosphere and put it back into the soil. And this Inflation Reduction Act will help to do that with $20 billion for cover crops and rotation of crops. Uh, this one I have mixed feelings about, we can talk about it uh, afterwards, but they've increased the social cost of carbon from $51 a ton to $85 a ton. This is gonna make the pipeline people rich fast. You're going to be able to pay for a carbon pipeline, I would estimate, in four years, something like that. That's a tremendous return on investment because if Summit Carbon, the pipeline company, claims they can uh, sequester 10 million tons of carbon dioxide a year, they will make $85 per ton for that in the credit from the Inflation Reduction Act. It's not all bad, I'm here to tell you, because if we're gonna do ethanol, and I don't know how you feel about that, I leave it up to you. I would personally, I'd rather turn the page on ethanol, but I don't see it happening. So um, it's going to eventually go away because we're heading towards an all electric fleet. But I don't see it going away in the near term for these goals that we must meet. And if that's true, then ethanol facilities in Iowa are going to have to reduce their emissions. The best way for them to reduce their emissions is to, and it's, a, it's a, in some ways an opportunity, in a fermentation plant like uh, ethanol fermentation, corn ethanol uh, plant, 90% of the emissions are CO2. It's very easy to, you have to take the water out but it's very easy to dry that and then compress it into a liquid stream. Take that liquid stream, put it into a pipeline, and we can't put it in the air anymore. We already agreed on that. Now we're gonna to try to put it in the ground. And it's gotta go 7,000 feet deep because it's gotta stay as a liquid so that it doesn't belch and come back up and, and suffocate people. But we can talk about the pipelines too. I'm here to say that, you know, I really believe uh, we are gonna transition out of this because it's gonna become ever more uh, apparent that it's much, much more expensive not to act than it is to act. And it's a much, much brighter future that we are going to create for our kids and our kids as kids, for the planet and for all other species. It's gonna be cleaner, no particles in the air, much less asthma, emphysema, you're gonna be able to see all the way across the Grand Canyon, much less lost time accidents, much less cardiovascular uh, uh, problems due to uh, air pollution, cleaner, healthier, fairer, and more resilient with millions and millions of jobs created for both adapting and uh, mitigating uh, climate change with better social justice and, and social equ equity. That brings me to, we can talk about the Sustainable Development Goals 
and the problems there. Uh, but thank heavens the United Nations is talking about these things. It really is a, a guideline for improving the entire human condition. That's what we're talking about, improving everything. We need climate action now. We need, we're going to mitigate and we're going to adapt, and it's going to create an awful lot of good jobs uh, for the future as an engine for our economic development. It's going to have create cleaner air, better soil, better health for people. But good things are happening already. Just look at Iowa. We're now at 60% of our electricity is coming from wind in Iowa. Good things are happening, wow. but we must move faster in order to stave off the worst impacts of climate change. 